Good evening, everyone. I'd like to welcome you to Grace Life Unleashed podcast with Pastor Dave. We're part of Breen Bible Church and Grace Life Church. And it's always an exciting time to be here. Why are we not advancing here? All right, come on. You can do it. There we go. You know what? I think the reason is is because we're on the wrong end of the system. There we are. Let's try that. And let's try that. Anyways, we're, we're <clears throat> part of Breen Bible Church, uh, Grace Life Church. We're located in Evansville, Indiana. And uh, if, for those of you who have been helping support us, we appreciate it. Um, it's P.O. Box 6033 in Evansville, Indiana. And the bottom here, let me get rid of my little 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 S here, is my phone number. So if you want to get a hold of me, please um, text me. Um, somebody's been calling me every day for like the last four or five days. Text me. I don't answer phone calls. I just don't have time. But... Anyways, <clears throat> if you want to go ahead and text me, please. I'm going to know more about us. It's gracelifeunleashed.com is our website. YouTube is Grace Life Unleashed by Dave Sigmund. Facebook, Grace Life Church and or Brian Bible Church. And if you get on the website or you get on Facebook, it links back to YouTube. And please subscribe and hit the alarm bell. And we do have a Rumble account also. Now again, life rule number one is don't get dead. I, uh, I heard a sermon the other day. Again, where somebody said Christians have a God-given right to take back America. And it, it said we should take back the school systems. We should take back government. We should take back entertainment. That God has given us that, and we should take it back. And folks, wrong dispensation. Uh, we're not Israel. God has not told us to take back anything as far as the government goes. This is Satan's world. He's not asked us to overtake the government, overthrow the government. In fact, it's almost the opposite. In 1 Timothy chapter 2, 1 through 4, Paul says, I exert therefore, first of all, supplications, prayer, intercessions, and giving you thanks be made for all men. And then he says, for kings and for all that are in authority, and here's what he wants us to do, that we may lead a quiet and a peaceable life in all godliness and honesty. For this is good and acceptable in the sight of God our Savior. And what does God want us to do? Well, he wants us to tell others about Christ. He said in verse 4, We will have all men to be saved and come unto the knowledge of the truth. These are marching orders and the dispensation of grace. This is our great commission, I guess you could say. I um, was talking to a lady the other day, and uh, she told me she really appreciated that I was others-orientated. And I told her, I said, well, I always wasn't that way. And I finally get over myself. But years ago, when I was working with Lori, she she got mad at me one day, and she told me to stop throwing Bible verses at her. And she was struggling with an issue, and I was giving her some of the best Bible verses I could give her, and they were actually really good ones. But then she said, just tell me what to do. And as we work with people, uh, you're going to work with people that are hurting uh, emotionally, uh, physically, and spiritually. And they're not going to be in a condition where they, I guess, want to take the time to study. And so they're going to ask you to just tell me what to do. And that can be frustrating because at that point, I guess you could say we take ownership. And so be aware of that. If you're working with somebody and you tell them what to do, um, they're going to now hold you responsible if it doesn't work. <laughs> so just, just be aware of that. But there comes a time when you go alongside somebody where... We just have to hold their hand. We have to tell them what to do because that's all they have. And my reference for that is Galatians 6. Um, Paul says, Brethren, if a man be overtaken in a fault, ye which are spiritual, restore, such as one in the spirit of meekness, concerning thyself, lest thou also be tempted. And then he tells us how we need to restore people. We bear ye one another's burdens. That That's the answer. The answer is you go alongside them and you pick them up, clean them up, Dust them off, in a sense, tell them what to do because they're incapable of making those decisions on their own. So be aware of that. You can't do that for everyone. Trust me. Pick and choose your battles, okay? 
bear one another's burdens and so fulfill the law of Christ. And then he, he goes on, he says, for if a man think of himself be something, when he is nothing, he see with himself. And then he said, verse 4, understand, verse 2, verse 4, verse 5, there's a transition going on here. He says, but every man prove his own work. That means we're going to go from tell me what to do to I'm going to make my own decisions. Quit telling me what to do. And I've seen people who have done that, you know, to where there's a time in their life when they want you to tell them what to do. And then they finally get to the point to where they would wish you would just shut up and quit telling them what to do. And that that's the goal. Get them back on their feet. I always say re release them back into the wild. And so as you work with people, you're going to run into some that you're going to have to bear their burdens, and you're going to run into others that you've been working with where they can bear their own burdens. And that's what Paul says in verse 5, so every man shall bear his own burdens. So it's a, it's a process. It's a process of picking them up, dusting them off, cleaning them up, getting them back on their feet, and then letting them go, and then they might be fine, and they might go back out there and just fall back on their face again. And then you pick them up. But our goal is to get people on their own. I've been doing this uh, Wednesday study and helping you understand the economy for over a year now. And when I started this, people basically were like, yeah, whatever, Dave. And some people actually very nicely warned me that I need to be careful, that I'm probably overstepping my bounds, and I probably was. But I saw things out there that really concerned me. I was following some people that I really trusted, and I wanted to help others. And um, when I presented some of this stuff at my church, one guy who's a really nice guy, he said, Dave, I, I have nothing to worry about because God's going to take care of me. And I went, what dispensation are you living in? I, I didn't say that out loud. I thought that to myself. Folks, we live in the dispensation of the grace of God, and God has not promised us health and wealth and prosperity. He did promise that to Israel. You know, God told Israel, you're the head, everybody else is the tail. God told Israel, you know, if you want, you know, if you want silver, I'm bringing you gold. In fact, we're you know, going to up it. You know, it's kind of like saying, you know, you want, you want paper, I'm bringing you plastic. You know, you want plastic, I'm bringing you, you know, whatever. You know, it, it's like only the best for you. And that's what God promised Israel. But remember, we are not Israel. We're not spiritual Israel. We're not anything Israel. We're not replacement Israel. We're not any of that. All that God promises us, us is that we're going to suffer for Christ's sake. Now, in the end, we're fine. I'm going to heaven. I'm seated in the right hand of God, just like Christ is. I'm going to live forever in heaven, and life's going to be great. Paul tells us he's going to give us above and beyond what we ask or think. That has to do with heaven, folks, not today. God has not promised you health or wealth or prosperity. If you have health and you have wealth and you have prosperity, praise the Lord. But that's not something that God has intervened and given you. Okay, it's called life. We live in a sin-cursed world among sin-cursed people. And sin's going to affect you, whether you like it or not. So as you look at the stock market, the stock market is kind of a beauty pageant. And guess what, guys? The stock market is manipulated. Understand that and know it. And then learn to play the game. That's why we said playing chess in a checkers world. Understand that the stock market is manipulated. It, it's, it's messed with. And then learn how to play under the radar and make some money. Okay? Now, one of the guys I was listening to the other day says we're getting close to pivoting because the banks are failing. Um, a lot of this has to do with the commercial market. A lot of these empty um, office buildings are being devalued at 50% over their uh, rate of what it was years ago. This is probably more of a COVID problem than anything else. And some of these uh, big loans are being defaulted on because these you know, loans are for millions of dollars and these buildings are not worth millions of dollars anymore. And so the, the owners are going, you can have my building. And so banks are taking a huge hit on empty office buildings and they cannot afford to do that. that. That's round one. So I think we're getting close, okay? And it's almost like, you know, I'm done warning people and I just can sit back now and wait for the world to blow up. But I'm going to keep talking. Um, the, the majority of the decline in the bear markets occurs after the Fed's pivot. And one guy thinks the Fed's going to pivot by the end of March. I don't know. 
I really don't know. But it hasn't pivoted yet, okay? We have, you know, declines of 36%, 48%, 27%, 51%, 58%, 35%. And someone told me that all that money they pumped into the um, economy because of COVID and really going back to 08 is all going to come out this time. And that could be scary. Um, This is a a picture of what they think is going to happen. And you're like, well, that's not that big of a deal, is it? Okay, well... Yeah, that is a 50% decline in the stock market. Imagine if the stock market goes down 50%. And in the cycle we're in, which is that the cycle, you know, it says three and this is four. Um, and uh, after four is five, and that's when it goes up again, but we'll all be dead by then. But this is the same cycle you we were in back in um, the Great Depression. And none of you who are listening lived through the Great Depression because those folks are pretty much all gone now. My grandfather did, and he didn't have real many good things to say about it. Imagine if we're actually going into the second Great Depression. How many people are going to hurt and suffer big time? Just be aware. And, and that's why I have this slide here. Um, prepare now so you don't despair later. My, If you're going to do anything, do nothing. As in, don't buy a house don't buy a car. I know you need to live. I realize that. Don't buy a new car. Don't buy a new boat. I'm not sure if you buy a used boat either. You know, don't don't buy big ticket items right now. Just hold off. Time is your friend right now. That's really all I can say. All right. Romans. I love Romans. In Romans 3.19, and we're, gonna, we're actually in Romans 4, but I want to go back to 3.19. Paul says in 19, now we know that what things whatsoever the law saith. It saith to them who are under the law that every mouth may be stopped and all the world may become guilty before God. The law was given to show Israel or show the world that they're guilty. Not to show them how to live, but to show them how they weren't living right. Okay, it was supposed to drive them back to God. Therefore, by the deeds of the law shall no flesh be justified in in his sight. For by the law is a knowledge of sin. Uh, verse 19 and 20, this, I just fix everything there. It's like, hey, we got a sin problem here. Verse 21 starts out with two words, but now. Now that tells us everything got, Paul has said before this, which would be Romans 1, Romans 2, and now pretty much two-thirds of Romans 3, is nothing to do with us at all. It was a time before. And really, Romans 1 was way back, way back. Starting probably going back to the Tower of Babel. That's how far back it went, way before the law. And now in verse 21, we're going to get to grace. So basically you could put, but now under grace, okay, the righteousness of God without the law is manifest, being witnessed by the law and prophets. Even the righteousness of God, which is by faith of Jesus Christ unto all and upon all them that believe, where there is no difference, for all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. We live in a dispensation of but now which is a change from the law. We are justified by faith in Jesus Christ's death, his burial, and his resurrection. And at that moment, we are declared just as righteous as Jesus Christ himself by God the Father. We're seated on the same level as Christ himself. Not because we're amazing, but because Christ is amazing and our faith is in Christ. That's how easy it is. I had a guy today ask me a question. He texted me a question. It was a good question. He goes, what do you say when somebody can't understand the Bible yet they claim they're saved? Is it because they can't understand the Bible that maybe they're not saved? And I went, no, I don't buy that. I've heard people say that. You know what it says? Well, a natural man can't understand the things of the Spirit. So that means if you can't understand the things of the Bible, you're probably not saved. I said, no, 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 I I don't buy that. If somebody gives me a testimony saying they are trusting in Christ's death, his burial, and his resurrection for their salvation, they're saved. Whether they understand the Bible or not, they're saved. Okay? Some people just don't have good Bible knowledge capabilities and it just takes time. Just because it takes time doesn't mean they're not saved. So don't, you know, 
you know, if you go up to somebody and say, well, you should understand the Bible better than you do since you claim to be saved. So I'm really doubting whether you're saved or not. Imagine you said that to somebody. You now created guilt. You created insecurity in them. They, they're not sure if they're saved or not. Folks, the salvation message is not, I know my Bible backwards and forwards and inside out. In that case, most of the world wouldn't be saved if that was the criteria. But then again, most of the world isn't saved anyways. <laughs> um, okay, it's faith in Christ alone, period. And even if you never read a verse in the Bible, or even though the Bible exists, if you're trusting in Christ alone and what he did for us, you're saved. So don't be making judgments on people's salvation based upon outward experiences in the sense of how smart they are. Um, that, that's works. Now, I do believe if you're saved that Bible verses can be easier to understand. I understand that. But don't base your salvation on that. Okay? All right, so we had Romans 3, and now we live in the but now. And last week we went through that Paul is using Abraham as an example of grace. But it's Abraham before circumcision. And then he uses David, which a lot of pastors find interesting, um, as an example also of somebody who's been justified apart from works because David's works did not match his, his status at all. But yet he was saved. And I think that's forgiveness under the law. But the thing of it is, Abraham is an amazing man because Abraham was justified before circumcision and I think he proved his justification after circumcision. He kind of like did them both. But in Romans 4, 15, it says, Because the law worketh wrath, for where no law is, there is no transgression. That's where we ended last week. Therefore, it is of faith. Okay? Our salvation is of faith. Not of the law, but it's of faith. That it might be by grace, to the end the promise might be sure of all the seed. Not to that only which is of the law, but to that also which is of the faith of Abraham who's the father of us all. So Paul is saying, hey, Father Abraham, father Abraham, or Abraham, is our father in regards to faith. And that's why Paul goes to him. He goes to him because Abraham was justified by faith apart from the law. Abraham was justified by faith, period. Abraham believed God. Boom. Just like we believe God. And God said, you want to be saved today? All you have to do is believe that Christ took your place, your punishment on that cross and died for your sins. End of discussion. It's faith plus nothing. You don't have to do anything. You don't have to prove anything. You just have to believe that Christ took your place and your punishment. All right, Paul goes on and this is in parentheses. He says, as is written, I have made thee a father of many nations. That's Abraham. Before him whom he believed, even God who quickeneth the dead and calleth those things which be not as though they were. God can make things happen. He's God. Okay? And now he's going he's gonna to go back and he's going to explain this, this faith that Abraham had. And it's an interesting faith. It has to do with Sarah and it has to do with Sarah getting pregnant and it has to do with God's promise of a seed who against hope, we went and looked at this last week, against hope, and, and hope, hope is confidence, who against confidence believed in confidence, okay? You know, I, you know the, the thing of it is, Abraham was frustrated because God promised him an a heir and his wife didn't get pregnant. And he's like, God, did I misunderstand you? I mean, what, what's going on here? And God's like, no, no, Sarah will get pregnant. God waited until there was absolutely no way anybody could say, well, that's just a natural occurring birth. He waited until everybody had to say, that obviously is a miracle. That's why he waited so long. So there was no chance that it just happened by natural means. It had to be of God, who against hope, believed in hope, that he might become the father of many nations according to that which was spoken. So shall thy seed be. So Abraham becomes an example of somebody who just said, all right, God, you say I'm going to have a kid. I believe you. Now, again, you know, Abraham wavered a little bit. I understand that. Sarah basically laughed. Um, because she knew there's no way she was getting pregnant by natural means. Okay, now, now Isaac was not, you know, a miraculous conception, 
but it, it went against all common sense, natural ability. Women don't get pregnant at 90. This don't happen. Again, 19 is talking about Abraham. And being not weak in faith, he considered not his own body, now dead, when he was about 100 years old. Neither yet the deadness of Sarah's womb. In other words, from a physical, normal standpoint, this wasn't going to happen. But yet from God's perspective, it was a done deal. And Abraham's like, okay, it's a done deal. And, and most people are like, oh, a stupid man. He just doesn't get it. Eh, I don't know. It says he believed God. He believed God. It says Abraham's 100 years old and, and Sarah's past childbearing age. And it says he, that's Abraham, staggered not at the promise of God through unbelief, but was strong in faith, giving glory to God. In Abraham's mind, it was God said it, that settled it. No, n nothing to worry about. God said it's going to happen. You know, he could sleep at night. How's that? Okay. And being fully persuaded that what he had promised, he was able also to perform. You know, Abraham's faith was not in Christ's death, his burial, and his resurrection. Abraham's faith is in that God says he's going to have a kid. And Abraham went, cool. Thank you. Good night. Boom. No stress. No, like, oh, no, does God need my help, you know? And therefore, it was imputed, that's his faith, to him for righteousness. So Abraham was declared righteous because of his faith in what God said. Interesting. That's why he's our, our father, too. Now, it was not written for his sake alone, but it, was, but it was imputed to him, but for us also. So Abraham becomes our example of what faith looks like, to whom it shall be imputed. If we believe on him that raised up Jesus our Lord from the dead, who was delivered for our offenses and was raised again for our justification. You know, when, when you believe that Christ died on the cross for your sins and he was buried and he rose again, God places you into the body of Christ and all the magic happens in the body. When you're placed in the body of Christ, you're declared just as righteous as Jesus Christ himself, who is just as righteous as God himself. So God imputes or, or places his righteousness on us. It's not our righteousness. Our righteousness is but filthy rags. If you want to know what our righteousness looks like, the lost are going to stand before God someday and they're going to be judged according to their righteousness. And you're like, oh no, the Bible says their works. Well, okay, it's going to be their supposedly works of righteousness. You know, they're going to stand before God and show God how amazing they are. They're going to show God how righteous they are. But those righteousnesses are worth nothing. Even on your best day, you're not good enough to get to heaven. That's why they say in order to get somebody saved, you have to get them lost first. And that can be very humbling. You have to admit you can't do it on your own. And most people won't go that far. You can't do it on your own. That's why Christ died on the cross. If you could do it on your own, Christ would have said, God would have said, go do it on your own. But there was no way we could do it on our own, so that's why Christ died on the cross for our sins. So when we believe that, God places his righteousness on us, and we are just as righteous as God himself, which allows us to be in heaven, allows us to have all of these cool things we are in Christ, justified, sanctified, seated on the right hand of God. I mean, just amazing things happen. Not because of us but because of God through Jesus Christ. Again, 25, who was delivered for our offenses and was raised again for our justification. We're totally justified in Christ. So Paul in Romans 3 switches gears and starts talking about grace. That's why I love Romans. And Romans just spells everything out step by step. This is why you're lost. This is how you get saved. And he goes to Abraham to prove what faith looks like. And you're like, well, what kind of faith? We don't have to believe that Sarah's going to have a baby. No, we have to believe that Christ took our place, our punishment on the cross, and died for our sins, period. I know he was buried and he rose again. I realize that. But the point is, he took our place. Do you believe that? It's not about us. It's about Christ. It's always about Jesus Christ. If you were to stand before God and stand in front of heaven's gate and God would look at you and go, why should I let you into my heaven? And you'd stand there and you'd go, well, I tried my best. That would be you're trying to do, supply your own righteousness. The correct answer is, I'll give you the answer. 
you look right back at God and you go, because Jesus Christ paid my entrance fee when he died for my sins and he was buried and rose again because Jesus paid for me. God will be like, come on down. Now, that scenario will never take place. I was explaining to the guy that the illustration I use about standing at heaven's gate is not ever going to happen because at the moment of death, either in heaven or you're in a place of waiting, there is no discussion. Everything that happens in regards to heaven or hell happens before you die. There is no second chance. That's why we have to talk to people this side of heaven, this side of hell. You know, a little bit of time you spend alive here on the earth, whether it be 70, 80, 90 years, 100 years maybe if you're lucky, probably not, will affect where you spend eternity. That's quite a responsibility for us who are alive. Paul says we're here in Christ said, it's our job as the body of Christ to tell others about Jesus Christ. End of discussion. Our job, we are the replacement for Jesus Christ. We're ambassadors for Christ. We are here in Christ's stead. You know, it's quite a responsibility. I hope you realize that it's up to us to tell the next generation. It's not going to happen on its own. God's not sending angels. He sent the body of Christ to tell others about Christ. So please, you know, start with your family. Most people are easier to talk to. Like, oh, you don't know my family. All right, go to your neighbor. Go to your friend. I don't care. Start with somebody. The key to becoming a good evangelist is to start evangelizing. And you learn what works. You learn what doesn't work. Do you expect people to, you know, give you kisses and love you? No, they're probably going to get mad at you. But do it anyways. Learn how to be tactful. Learn how to be nice. Learn how to do it correctly. Folks, this is about eternity. Eternity. We're trying to keep people out of spending eternity in hell by telling them about Jesus Christ. That's, that's our responsibility. Let's not take it lightly. Let's pray. Lord, Heavenly Father, again, we thank you for salvation. Lord, you, you died on the cross for our sins. You were, you were buried. You rose again. We thank you for that. We thank you, Lord, for loving us so much that you took our place and our punishment on that cross. And we pray, Lord, that we will not take that responsibility lightly, but realize that it's our job to talk to others. We pray, us in your name. Amen.